and a welcome to all of you in a new podcast of wisdom, order, disorder, and so on. Today I'm going to read and go with you through the chapter of the power of forgiveness. This is your pastor, Yeti. Among the most powerful of human experiences is to give or to receive forgiveness. I am told that two-thirds of the teaching of Jesus is directly or indirectly about this mystery of forgiveness. God's breaking of God's own rules. That's not surprising, because forgiveness is probably the only human action that reveals three goodnesses simultaneously. When we forgive, we choose the goodness of the other over their faults. We experience God's goodness flowing through ourselves, and we also experience our own goodness in a way that surprises us. That is an awesome coming together of power, both human and divine. I want to share a personal story of forgiveness that happens in my family near the time of my mother's death. And this is a story of the author. I was planning to travel home to Kansas, thinking my mother would already be gone by the time I arrived and we had the funeral. We had spent many good visits together during her final days and she seemed ready to go. After hearing that she was hanging on, I delayed my arrival for a few days, then took the trip. She was still alive when I arrived, and I didn't expect what happened when I got there. I was sitting by my mother's bed, and I told her how I'd miss her. Now, as I have described before, this, this early farming woman was no sentimentalist. All of a sudden she said to me, I want to hear it from him. I said, what? She said, him. I responded, you mean daddy? She said, yeah, I want to hear if he's going to miss me. So I went quickly to my father at that point, a man of 84, whom we still called daddy. For weeks, even months, he had been telling her that he would miss her, but she wanted to hear it one more time for him and from him. So I said, Daddy, she wants to hear that you're going to miss her. He came over and effusively told her, Oh, I'm going to miss you, yeah? She replied, I don't believe it. I couldn't believe my ears, I said. Mother, you're a few hours from death. You can't say that. She persisted. I don't believe it. Daddy redoubled his efforts. I ask your forgiveness for all the times I've hurt you in our 54 years of marriage. And I forgive you for the times you've hurt me. I said, Mother, isn't that beautiful? Now say that back to Daddy. Suddenly, She closed her eyes and claimed up. She didn't want to say it. She was a typical Enneagram 8. I never felt more the priest. Here I had to coach my own mother. I said, Mother, you're soon going to be before God. You don't want to come before God without forgiving everybody. She said, I forgive everybody 
I said, but do you forgive daddy? And she became silent again. Then daddy jumped in and said, honey, I never fooled around with any other woman and women. We all knew that she responded. Well, I know that. I know that. My siblings and I still don't know what the big issue was. But any married person knows there are many little ways a couple can hurt one another over 54 years. There are little grudges, perhaps even big ones, which we hold. So I told her, Mother, you know we are Father. You're only going to get as much forgiveness from God as give of you and as given uh, you you've given. Now you've got to forgive Daddy. She kept her eyes closed. I pulled every Christian trick out of the bag, but she kept her eyes closed. Nothing was working. Then I said, Mother, let's try this. I'm going to put one hand on your heart, and I'm going to pray that your heart gets real soft. I felt her other hand, and I started kissing it while I held the first hand over her heart. After about a minute, she said, very faintly that melts me i responded what she said when you kiss my hand like that now i've got to do it after a pause she continued i'm a stubborn woman all my life i've been a stubborn woman well mother we all knew that i said now look at daddy and you tell him so she looked over and she didn't say daddy as she usually did. She spoke to him by name, Rich, I forgive you. I prompted her again, mother, the other half, I'll ask for your forgiveness. She started breathing really quickly, breathing so heavily, I thought it was the end. Then she summed her energy. She said, Rich, I ask your forgiveness. She continued with the heavenly breathing, then with the heavy breathing, I mean, and then she said, that's it, and that's it. That's what I had to do. She had been thinking, talking for days during the previous week about a mesh. I couldn't understand what it was. She had said, there's a mesh that I'm trying to get through. Now, I said to her, Mother, do you think that think that was the mesh? She replied, it's gone. The mesh is gone. And God, I pray that I mean this forgiveness come from my heart. Then she said, referring to my two sisters and my sisters-in-law, Tell the girls to do this early and not to wait till now. They'll understand a woman's heart and the way a man can hurt a woman. This took place four days before she died. Now, this might seem like a tiny thing, but that's the way that we can get blocked up. The way we can be blocked. I'm not sure, but I think all of this might have come from an old quarrel over something most of us would consider insignificant. So, let's move on. But as married people know, some of those struggles carry a deeper symbolic meaning in the relationship. So, all we knew was that Daddy occasionally ran over her flowers with the lawn mower. She claimed it was intentional and we ourselves sometimes wondered. He was the grass man and she was the flower woman and they bought, both fought for more space. I suppose it was a symbolic, a symbol of something much deeper in their souls, not hard to figure out. On that level, little things can in fact be quite deep and significant. Symbols perhaps, but symbolic actions is often the real action, especially, it seems, to many women. 
whatever it had been about. I was utterly happy. I said, aren't you glad you said it, mother? She responded, I am so happy. I'm so happy. My sister came in a few minutes later, and before I had the chance to tell her the conversation, she talked to mother, and then she came running back to me. She said, mother says the mesh is gone, and she is so happy. That's the power and the grace of forgiveness in my own life with my own stalwart mother. That's the story from the author. So, let's move on with our class. Isn't that amazing? Important to listen in what is being said. It's important before people pass away, if we still have the time to be there. But the other woman was waiting, waiting that things could be said and done. So let's do it now and not wait until later. Let's ask for the grace to let go of those grudges and those hurts to which we cling. How else will we ever be free? Let's live inside of that wonderful good news that says, my deepest me is God. We have come forth from God. We are sons and daughters and heirs of something that we did not create it. In forgiveness, we live up to our truest dignity. We operate by a power, not our own. We live out of the true self and not just the tiny self that is always offended and complaining. This is the genuinely new thing that true believers have to offer the world. We are like God. I'm going to give you another author, David Tracy, a powerful American theologian, wrote a book called The Analogical Imagination. He concluded that the great Catholics, I mean, I see the word Catholic as universal. Maybe some people will have difficulties with that, but if you go to the Greek and the translation, you will find that it's universal. So the great Catholics who've really been transformed by their Catholic worldview have an analogical way of seeing reality. They see God and their own reality as analogous or like. It is a result of the Catholic Christian emphasis in incarnation. I believe it always sees heaven and earth as mirroring each other, not distinct, but in fact most similar. As move on, we would say, or if we argue from the other side, and in other case, we have a wonderfully coherent and sacramental universe. The Catholic mind, at least in its heyday, represents the analogical imagination. It was always emphasized, God is like, God is similar to, we are the image of, and God is the same as. St. Bonaventura's Vestigia Dei, the very fingerprints of God, all the world is a poem about God. All of reality is an analogy for God. This, of course, had a good side and a bad side. The good side was that we could be at home in the real world, 
the actual was a place of grace, not the idolized or religious world. We still see this in Mediterranean Catholic countries where the Catholic imagination took the strongest hold on culture. They don't apologize for fiestas and holidays, for drinking, eating, sex, and dancing. All that was still a bit shadowing to the Nordic Catholics. The Teutonic and Anglo-Saxon types, they never really got the humorous, ironic side of human existence so well summarized in the poem. It comes, wherever the Catholic sun doth shine, there's always laughter and good red wine. At least, I've always found it so. Benedicamus Dominus. You can check it out and study the theologian Buenaventura, Saint Buenaventura. Ironically, this was written by an English Catholic through, although of French heritage. He lived Belloc, 1817 and 1953. David Tracy, as I mentioned earlier, claims that in central, I mean in general, the Protestant and Jewish minds imagine these differently. They tend to emphasize the difference between God and the world. In the Protestant case, we can see it in the theology of Karl Barth, 1886-1968, and many of the Swiss reformers who continuously emphasizes the otherness of God. We certainly see that same emphasis on transcendings in much of the Jewish spirituality too. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, Isaiah 6, verse 3. The incarnation might be unthinkable to most Jews, which is why it is still so strange that it happened amidst the Jewish people. As always, we each have part of the truth. God is both imminent, present in the world, and transcendent beyond ordinary experience. In good theology, it seems to me, we Catholics emphasize the eminences for good and for ill. Protestants and Jews and Muslims, too, emphasize the transcendence for good and for ill. The bad side of reality as an analogy for God was that Catholicism tended to get pretty slack. God was almost too chummy and forgiving. Our Protestant brothers and sisters rightly challenged us on that. At one point, two-thirds of the year was feast days and holidays in Italy. Talk about the opposite of the Protestant word ethic. All they did was party. Life meant being at home in this world with God, one another, and our bodies. The Catholic comfort with drinking is still scandalous to many of our Protestants brothers and sisters. But Catholic countries are also notorious for tolerating dictators, political corruption, bribes, greedy upper classes, and non-democratic, non-accountable leadership. Our political record is put to shame by clear-headed Anglo-Saxon and Protestant respect for law and accountability. God as a distant polis surgeon does have its social merits. There has always been a kind of cultural Catholicism which doesn't really take the gospel seriously. We did not even read them. Or take Jesus' teaching very seriously. We preferred Sagarin, Sacred Heart, Novenas. Yet, at the same time, it often produces very compassionate and forgetting people. 
it retained a kind of mysticism that was lost elsewhere. Protestantism always seemed to produce people who were filled with judgments and criticism of everything. Yet it also produces people much more submittal to the concrete teaching of Jesus and much more socially responsible, in my opinion. The Mennonites on simple living, the Quakers on war, the Lutherans on grace, the Pentecostal on the Holy Spirit, the Amish Congregationalists and the Presbyterians on different aspects of practical community, the holiness churches on sheer joy in God. At its best, the anal analogical imagination creates very patient and less judgmental people. I think they feel less judged by God and tend to be more tolerant of others. It's forgive us as we forgive them, kind of thinking. Perhaps it's now here better symbolized in literature than in The Power and the Glory by Graham Greene, 1904-1991. Greene was a great Catholic in his magical world, as were walking Percy, Victor Hugo, Françoise Mauriac, and Flannery O'Connor. They lived and wrote out of the anal analogical imagination. Perhaps you remember the hero of Green's novel, the whiskey priest, the drunk, but Green makes him dear, a saint, and every man. The shocking idea was that he could still put God on people's tongue. God uses sinners, which is all of us. The whiskey priest was still the meditate, mediator between God and humanity drunk or not. The people still kissed his hand, knowing his sin, but knowing that God forgives all sin and that we all are sinners. A sincere Protestant would never have written that book. The sinner is too unlike God to ever be used by God or set up as any kind of hero. If we don't get forgiveness, we're missing the whole mystery. We are still living in a world of meritocracy of quid pro quo thinking of performance and behavior that earns an award forgiveness is the great towing of all logic reason and worship uh, worthiness it is a melting into the mystery of god an unearned love unmerited grace, the humility and powerlessness of a divine lover. Forgiveness is the beginning, the middle, and the end of the whole gospel, as far as I can see. Without radical and rule-breaking forgiveness received and given, there will be no reconstruction of anything. It alone breaks down or damnable worldview, our damnable worldview, of trying to buy and sell grace. Grace is certainly the one gift that must always be free, perfectly free in order for it to work. Without forgiveness, there will be no future. We have heard one another in too many historical, documented and remembered ways. The only way out of the presence justified hatreds of the world is grace. As a Christian, I do believe that Jesus' death was a historical breakthrough, and it is no accident that Christians date history around his life. Afterward, 
he could never quite see things in the same way. The virus of the Gospel was forever released into human history. Archetypally pictured as blood flowing from the crucified, it was only a minority of Christians who ever got the point. However, still the toothpaste cannot be put back into the tooth. The movement of grace cannot be reversed. Most Christians, with other irony, worship Jesus the scapegoat on Sundays and on the other six days of the week. Make scapegoats of Jews, Muslims, other Christian denominations, heretics, sinners, pagans, the poor, and almost anybody who was not like themselves. One would have thought that Christians would gaze upon the one they had pierced, would have gotten the message about how wrong domination, power, and hatred can be. The system had been utterly wrong about their own chosen God figure, yet they continued to trust the system. I guess they did not gaze long enough. Many followers of other religions seem to have been infected by the virus more than most nominal Christians. Girard says that the Christian West was the most destabilized by the virus of the gospel, then moved into the overdrive to cover its fear and it, its need to hate, despite the order from its designated God. The central teaching of Jesus on love of enemy, forgiveness and care for those at the bottom was supposed to make scapegoating virtually impossible and unthinkable. Scapegoating depends upon a rather sophisticated but easily learned ability to compartmentalize, to separate the divine, the world into the pure and the impure. Anthropologically, all religion begins with the creation of the impure, and very soon an entire moral system emerged with taboos, punishments, fear, guilt, and even a priesthood to enforce it. It gives us a sense of order, control, and superiority, which is exactly what the ego wants and the small self demands. But before you start hating historical religions too much, think about red meat. Well, I'm not because I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> Patriarchy, bourgeois values, all institutions, sexist language, and even Christianity itself. This have become the new impure contaminants. Remember, it only gets more sophisticated and justified. The absolute religion genius of Jesus is that he utterly refuses all that codes, purity codes, religious quarantines, and the searching for sinners. He refuses the very starting point of his historic religion. He refuses to divide the world into the pure and the impure, much to the sagrament of almost everybody, then and now. Jesus is shockingly not upset with sinners. This is a shock so total that most Christians to this day refuse to see it. He is only upset with people who do not think they are sinners. These denying, fearful, and illusory ones are the blockage. They are much more likely to hate and feel no compunction. And formally, religious thought, its mission was to expel sin and evil from the river city. Through Jesus, we learn that sin lies in the very act of expelling. There is no place to expel it to. We have met the enemy 
and the enemy is us. We either carry and transform the evil of human history as our own problem, or we only increase its efficiency and power by hating and punishing it over there. The Jesus pattern was put precisely and consciously by Paul. For our sake, he made the sinless one a victim for sin, so that in him we might become the uprightness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 And I admit that is heavy stuff. Only the mystics and the sinners seem to get it. <clears throat> In the story of the Good Samaritan, <clears throat> Jesus tells of a man by the side of the road walking up in enemy territory, realizing that he has been loved by the very one who is supposed to hate him and whom he is supposed to fear. Could this be everybody's awakening? Could this be an accurate image of God's discovery and true discovery? Jesus is clearly presenting the foreign Samaritan as the very image of God. He ends the shocking parable by saying, Go and do the same. Luke 10, 37. The human task has become the very imitation of God, which seems almost unthinkable. God, the one that history has been thought to fear, is in fact the other goodness that unfolds us and creates a safe and non-threatening universe for us, a renewed universe that we can now pass on to others. For Jesus, there are no postures, group memberships, behaviors, prayer rituals, dietary rules, asceticism, or social awareness that, of themselves, transforms us or makes us enlightening, safe, or superior. There are no contaminating elements or people to expel or exclude. These will be exposed as inadequate when goodness is exposed all the more. If that is not the moral message that shouts from Calvary, I cannot imagine what the message is. There is no redemptive violence there. There is only redemptive suffering. Yet hate, and yes, hate, is a norm but hate is never the future. I say it again. Yes, hate is the norm, but hate is never the future. It is the old and the dead story. Okay. I think this was a clear message where I will not add more words. The only thing I will say, it is so important to forgive others, to open prison, let people go free. Sometimes things happen so quickly and hate reveals and there is no forgiveness. Let this podcast open your eyes to set people free and maybe to set yourself free because if you forgive others you open the door also for yourself and remember that our father ends with his words if you forgive others or not the father forgive you or will not so may you find peace within and may God bless you with an abundance and overflowing as never before. God bless you. This is your Pastor Yeti. Bye-bye.